Je, je pense qu'à ce moment-là, on peut passer directement à la, première présentation, la deuxième présentation donc de notre collègue de Seattle, euh, Richard Satava, qui va nous parler justement de ses fondamentaux euh, en, en, en robotique, en chirurgie robotique, afin de nous exposer ce qui est euh, débuté, ce qui est mis au point aux États-Unis concernant cet enseignement sur le tronc commun de nouveau. Il s'agit d'une formation globale de la chirurgie robotique. Professeur Azatava oui. Professeur, donc l'exposé le, le, sera réalisé en anglais. Uh, professor Zatava is uh, professor emeritus of surgery at the University of Washington. Uh, he was a program manager for at the defense for a defense advanced research project agency. Uh, he was director of the NASA Commercial Space Center. Uh, he was initially a military surgeon. And his focus is now in uh, medical education research. <coughs> He is the principal investigator for fundam the fundamentals of robotic surgery. It he was at the beginning of uh, robotics in surgery, in, in, in especially with the, the intuitive society. He was also at the beginning of uh, simulation in surgery with uh, the mimic society. Please, Professor Zatava, thank you for coming. Yes, merci beaucoup. Uh, mes collègues, mes apologies, je ne sais pas le français. Un peu. So, I must speak in English. I will speak slowly. Uh, Jacques gave a very good introduction to not only the need for simulation and training, but what the fundamental goals are. I will try to show you the implementation of it and I will tell you the extent of the project and those who are involved in order to create such a project. <coughs> the most important thing is that there are about 90 years of simulation history in the military, nuclear security, and other industries, <coughs> as was indicated by <coughs> Dr. Hubert. We went to those societies and we asked them, how, what is the process, the methodology, by which you create this training. We saw the simulators, but that wasn't enough. It's about the content, it's not about the simulators. And so we extracted from them the process that's required, which we call a full curriculum development. We have two grants, uh, well over two and a half uh, US million dollars, and they come from the Department of Defense and from industry. Mm -hmm intuitive surgical, to co-fund this project to develop the content for the fundamentals of robotic surgery. We began with the mission statement is to create and develop a validated multi-specialty technical skills proficiency-based curriculum for surgeons to safely and efficiently train and assess basic robotic surgical skills. This is not about surgical procedures, it's about the technical skills in order for any surgeon who wants to use the robot, they would need to pass the course in order to go on to looking at robotic surgery training. They should not go directly to robotic surgery after this course. As you can see here, there was a, a program that was put into place with multiple principal investigators. We had a very strict vetting process for our subject matter experts. Uh, during the curriculum development, there was no participation by industry. This was exclusively content developed by surgeons. Their outcomes, metrics, skills, team training were all done by a consensus conference. There is no one expert, it's multiple experts. And it's driven by milestones. Again, chart that allowed us to meet those milestones. The tasks of the process were to determine what the scope was. We decided that robotic surgery is complex enough that we are going to limit the curriculum that we develop to the moment the patient comes in the operating room until the moment they leave. We assume that they have the cognitive knowledge on the indications, contraindications, and so forth. And so we're focusing just what you do, all the skills required once the patient is in the operating room and just before they leave the operating room. Uh, we had to define the outcomes measures, the psychomotor skills, validation trials, create a high-stakes test to validate it. I'll mention that later. 
And then finally, <clears throat> move on next word. The scope of the curriculum, the didactic portion, as you can see, has preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative stages inside of the operating room. Preoperative, for example, is something like the checklists before you actually do the procedure while the patient or just before the patient's being put to sleep. Uh, we did include in part of our preoperative the insertion of the trocars and because we were focusing on robotic surgery. Psychomotor skills has the same preoperative, interoperative, and postoperative skills that need to be done. And in the psychomotor skills, this was a keenly and unique part of the curriculum because this is the component at which the surgeon has their head in the console. They can't see the rest of the operating room. They can't see the patient unless they pull their head out and look around. And because of that, communication is a very critical component of this. The first assistants, the scrub nurse, the anesthesiologist need to not only know what the surgeon is doing, but they have to be able to communicate to them to see if there is something unusual during the procedure that the surgeon cannot see, they must alert him. They have to be his eyes and his ears because those are buried within the council. And then as I mentioned, communication and team training is absolutely essential for this. These are the organizations that were involved in developing this curriculum. As you can see, we have a list of approximately 30 different organizations. These included people from around the world, the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, London, uh, the uh, Royal Australasian College of Surgeons. We had members from France, Professor Hubert also was participating in this. And these are the names of the contributors during the consensus conference. Not everyone was at each consensus conference, but these are the experts that we involved. And it had not only surgical experts, we had behavioral psychologists, medical educators, statisticians, psychometricians, and others who have expertise in the science of education curriculum development. So we did not rely upon our surgeons to be the world's best education curriculum scientist. We had those available for us as well. <coughs> These were the requirements or the limitations for the curriculum. It was basic skills across all specialties. We had 16 different surgical societies, the Department of Defense, and our military veterans hospital participate in this. They agreed, the specialties agreed, that once the fundamentals of robotic surgery were complete, they will develop their own fundamentals of robotic surgery and their advanced technology that needed to be taught. The reason was that as we developed the fundamentals of robotic surgery, some of our gynecologists said, well, we don't use any clips. We always use, we always tie off with suture ligature. And the urologist said, we never use any ligatures, we always use clips. So for that reason, we did not include clip applying as part of our fundamentals, with the expectation that the specialty will develop their own fundamentals. And as uh, Dr. Berkeley will tell you shortly, there is, because of the success of the first part of the fundamentals of robotic surgery, gynecology has already begun the fundamentals of robotic gynecologic surgery with tests that are specific to gynecology that are not usually done by other procedures, by other specialties. We tried initially to leverage off the tasks from the fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery. They had been validated. We knew that they were good. The interesting thing was in our pre preliminary study, we discovered that we could not discriminate between a novice and an expert using the fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery. What this meant was the tasks were too easy. A novice didn't have to train in order to do the tasks in the fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery. They did not challenge the, the young novice in order to do it. So we had to develop more difficult tasks. And one of the main reasons for that is in robotic surgery, we have enhancements of human capability and it also had a risk that allowed us an extra degree of freedom that allowed us to do things that you can't do with the straight sticks of laparoscopic surgery. 
when you saw that uh, prototype that uh, Dr. Hubert showed you, there are, of the seven tasks that are on that device, four of them cannot be done laparoscopically. They have been designed in such a way that you cannot manipulate a straight instrument. You must use not only the wrist, but the other things such as clutching and so forth. This was designed so that when a student is trained, they will be able to take advantage of capabilities that the robot has, not simply replicate what laparoscopic surgery does. These are our subject matter experts. As I mentioned earlier, clinicians, educators, behavioral psychologists, psychometricians, all the different societies in there, the Department of Defense and Simlearn from the veterans. There is a separate society called ASSET, the Alliance of Surgical Specialties for Education and Training, which we were able to harvest the members that participated in ASSET are the same people that participated in the fundamentals of robotic surgery. They had spent a year developing a curriculum template with all the essential features that needed to be put into a curriculum to make it a valid curriculum. And rather than spending weeks and months developing the process of the curriculum, we were able to use the one that had been developed by the same people, but in an earlier one. We also had a formal executive committee and organizational structure. The purpose of that was to review the work that was done by the experts and to approve it. So that this wasn't just a number of experts that came together and decided what they wanted to do, but rather the executive co committee reviewed the work to ensure the quality of the experts was up to par. <clears throat> this is what the asset looks like. It was housed under the American College of Surgeons accredited institutes, uh, educational institutes. That's the body that certifies uh, simulation and training centers around the world. There are currently 82 simulation centers that have been certified around the world by the American College of Surgeons. Uh, the relationship, as I mentioned, between FRS is that they were the same groups and there is an interoperability between the people that developed the curriculum template and those who developed the FRS. And this is an example of what the curriculum template looks like. We are looking at the only component between the red lines, which is the course that we're developing, the Fundamentals of Robotic Surgery. And there's two things that I think are important <coughs> to note that are there in yellow. First, errors. We teach people to make mistakes. When we did the first Fundamentals of Laparoscopic Surgery validation study to proficiency, which I will mention before, uh, a bit later, I was watching a student performed the tasks, and that student made the same mistake over and over. And I said, this is the third time you've made exactly the same mistake. What do you think the response was? Professor, you never told me that was a mistake. How am I supposed to know? This is not a priori. Not, it is not sufficient to tell a student this is the right thing. You also need to teach them what is wrong so they can avoid making that mistake. And if they happen to make that mistake, they can recognize it and remediate for it. So errors is key to the fundamentals of robotic surgery. The second thing that we did is that when the didactic component is finished above, they take a test. They have to pass it with the same score that the experts would pay, or else they have to go back again. The purpose for this is, if you're doing psychomotor skills training, hand-eye coordination and so forth, if they make a mistake, you need to know if they made the mistake because they didn't know what they were doing, are they stupid? Or was it because they had poor hand-eye coordination? Are they a klutz? And that way you can determine if they need to go back and read some more or they should do some more practice. This is one way that we could differentiate between cognitive deficiency and practice psychomotor deficiency. And finally, when we finish, we have uh, an assessment that goes back to the individual, tells them how well they do, and for the team training components, we have briefing, debriefing sessions. The methodology for the consensus conference was the standard Delphi conference, bring experts together, <clears throat> go over the curriculum, everybody has their choice of what is important for it, and they must come to a consensus 
we lock them in the room and they can't come out for lunch until they finish and agree on what the exact answer should be. When that is finished, we bring this together and have a rough draft and then it goes out anonymously over emails, which is the classic Delphi methodology, and they must go ahead and respond to that, not with any influence from other peoples in the room, but rather what they really think in case there was any bias involved. Finally, for this, we put a public forum. Once we knew what exactly what our curriculum was, we invited people, the simulation companies, the engineers, other clinicians, other interested people, to give input to this. We didn't need to change the curriculum, but we wanted to at least test others who weren't developing the curriculum what they thought of it. So this is the methodology that we use for our <coughs> consensus conferences. Now, <coughs> these are the consensus conferences we had. I'll show you a graph that represents these parts. The consensus conference were about setting the outcomes measures. What is it that you want to measure that this student must do? And then, how do you measure it? The metrics. What are you going to use? Centimeters of distance, seconds of time, and so on and so forth. Then we develop the curriculum. Then, <coughs> if we have a simulation, a simulator, then we adapt it to the curriculum. If there's none, we have to build a simulator. When that is finished, then we move on to the validation study design. You design the validation trial before you start the trial, which is a very meticulous process. And finally, there's the high stakes testing. Because there is inherent bias when a faculty trains somebody, there is inherent bias for them to give them the final test for certification. That's why we have boards and so forth to have an external, and so we are developing high stakes test at this time to measure the performance based upon the way they're going. This is probably the most important slide. This is what the full life cycle development of a curriculum is, modified from industry and used here, uh, from, uh, from the military rather, and used here for healthcare. You start with the outcomes measures, you develop your curriculum, the other two lines in there show you the, Im the important people that are involved and the method which you use, consensus conferences and so forth. Once the simulator is finished and your validation studies are complete, then you have your separate high stakes testing and evaluation. That goes to the board and the board for certification is able to go ahead and accept that. The important <coughs> issue is here is that after this curriculum is developed, the board has to remain involved in feedback on the performance of the students. If the students aren't doing well, there may be a fault with the curriculum. Just because we had all the experts and everybody reviewed it and we had a high stake test does not mean that it's that great of a curriculum. The final one is the outcomes of the performance of our students. So, <coughs> The value of a common curriculum template that we developed for the fundamentals of robotic surgery and is now being used by the others is we can do comparative effectiveness with or uh, oranges comparing to oranges, not oranges comparing to apples. If you use the same type of template, the same methodology, then you're highly likely to have outcomes that have a <coughs> much higher validity than if you're taking this curriculum and that curriculum and trying to compare results. Very critical. And this is what it looks like. Dr. Robert Sweet, a urologist, I'm embarrassed to say, is the one that developed this and he uh, outlined the way it would structure. Um, this is just the date line showing you how long it took us. It took us two years to get to the validation studies and trials. A few practical issues. This is how you develop outcome measures. Uh, this is from behavioral psychology. It's rather simple. What you do is you look at the tasks across the top and on the side are the skills. And then you try to match the tasks that you, that the skills that you did, how many tasks can I use in order to incorporate all the skills that we determined were necessary. When we did the psychomotor skills design, because we had robotic surgery, we had a unique opportunity. For those of you who haven't heard me lecture before, a robot is not a machine. A robot is an information system. It happens to have arms, it has eyes, but think about it, the first time you do robotic surgery, or let's look at laparoscopic surgery. How many of you thought of laparoscopic surgery as the first time you operated on a patient without ever seeing them? 
You don't. You're not looking at the patient. You're looking at the video image, which is information that represents what's inside of the body. The first time you do robotic surgery is the first time that not only do you not see the patient, but you don't touch them. What you do is you move the handles, electronic signal, information goes to the tip, and it does what you tell it to do. You become an information manager. The importance of that is you can change the information, if you will, between the camera and your eyes, or between your hands and the end of them. Why is that important? The limitation of human performance is 100 microns. There is no member of Homo sapiens on this planet that has an accuracy of greater than 100 microns. Anyone can sit down at the Da Vinci robot or the previous one that was there at the zoo by computer motion and have 10 micron accuracy. But when you think about it, the robot is nothing more than a tool. How many of you, when you operate, use your fingernails and your teeth? I dare say none. That's how we started. And then we had stone tools, and then we had metal tools, and then we had things like scissors, complex tools, and then we began having information. The robot is nothing more than some way to improve my performance. This is not about the robot doing something. It's about you being able to do something better than the hands, eyes that you were born with. This is absolutely key. So these are some of the other things that we looked at. Uh, it has to be a 3D set of tasks, and um, it has to be developed so when new robotic devices come by, we'll be able to use it in new robotic surgery. That's number eight, the agnostic to the robotic device. And the other thing that we had is it must be able to go ahead <coughs> and do it both on a simulator in virtual reality and a simulation with real physical objects in front of the robot so that we have both real and virtual capabilities to this. This just once again says the same way we match the tasks to the skills and incorporate multiple skills in one task so we don't have to do 26 different operations but rather we do seven different operations or tasks that include all of them. Uh, and these are the seven tasks that we have. There are some that are not performed with the device. These are the team training ones that allow us to use mannequins and other things as well. And then I'm not going to go through this just to flash. This is the table that we use to develop. You describe what the, the correct way to do something and what the errors are. And then you have the desired uh, instrumentation and the type of instructional material that is used with it. This is probably uh, one of the unique things down in the bottom was the first of the devices that we built. Notice it's a computer design, it's not a physical design. And what we were able to do is use it on multiple different types of simulators. You see down here um, one called the Ross, one over there is the virtual simulator, the DVD. This is the backpack. This simulation runs on all of them. It's independent of it. In addition to that, we took the computer program we sent it to a printer, a 3D printer, and it prints out precisely the same objects that you see for the virtual environment, exactly the same objects as the one that you're going to use. So we don't have any difference between the real and the virtual world. And when we do our validation study, one arm of the study is gonna be, is there any difference if you train and assess on a virtual as opposed to the real objects? Here is the uh, device uh, that was originally designed and then it went to the prototype that Jacques uh, has showed you a few moments ago. And once again, the seven tasks on a single device makes it much easier to be able to use. And we had the separate, an entire separate portion of the curriculum devoted only to team training and communication across pre, intra and post operative, mainly using checklists and mainly based upon something called Team Steps that was developed for communication skills, which was based on the way the military does things. <coughs> Finally, the one thing that's important is we are, we are going to be training to proficiency. What that means is that we will have our students use the robotic training system until their score is 100%. They are not going to go for two days and pass with 75% and then begin operating. They will get 100%. The way that you do that is once you have your curriculum, 
This is the learning curve I'm sure you're all familiar with with any type of educational activity. And <clears throat> the number of trials it takes until you do not make any improvement. We take our experts, these are experienced surgeons with over 100 robotic surgical cases, <clears throat> and we see what their particular performance would be, each individual. Then the red represents the mean of the score of the experts. One level below is somebody that's competent meaning that they can pass, but not necessarily consistently so. Proficient means that they pass every single time. They do not pass one time and then fail the next time and pass again and so forth. And then of course, expert one standard deviation above is a true expert. They're able to perform much better than the average expert would be. And this goes along, if you will, with the Dreyfus and Dreyfus model of performance. How do one train to performance from novice all the way up to expert, 1985? And then we did a validation study, and it, we're going to follow this at the end before we actually do the validation study. We will train the trainers. The faculty members that are going to teach the course will have their own course so that they know how to train. And we're going to look at integrated reliability to ensure that all of the faculty members train the same way and hopefully eliminate the majority of the bias. So, I want to thank you for the opportunity to show you what we are developing right now. It's an objective curriculum, and it requires multi-specialties, multiple surgeons, educators, and psychologists. Templates are developed, and as I mentioned, and Jeff may have an opportunity to tell you, that template becomes available for future surgeons, or for any of you who you would like it, to decrease the time and the efficiency in developing your own curriculum. You don't have to do everything in there, but we've had international experts looking at this for over two years now. And this may be a way that you can more actively and quickly develop curriculum that meet your needs. We're trying to break down the silos. I don't know why a surgeon in the United States, a surgeon in France, a surgeon in Japan, all of them have to have independent, different curriculum and different certification. Yes, I realize there's regional issues or political issues, and not all bodies are the same, but for core principles, the science doesn't change. The body and its basic principles doesn't change. And so the fundamentals should be applicable across all nations. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Rick. Yes. Thank, I'm sorry. Give it back. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Sastava, for, for this excellent talk. For me, it was a great moment. I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Each time I went to Chicago for the ACS AI Accredited Institute, mm -hmm. I appreciate your, your talk. I appreciate your workshop. Thank you so much.